Hey guys, today we're going to be solving lead code question 636, exclusive time of functions. This is a decent medium level question. Um, it does have a lot of uh, downwards. I think the reason for that is there are a couple of tricky things that are very easy to miss, which can actually frustrate you. But otherwise, the concept of the problem is fine. Um, it is when you go through the question, it immediately strikes you as a stack question and it is a stack question. It will be solved using a stack, but it has a couple of things that we need to take care of. I hope you've read the problem statement. It's uh, it's a well worded problem statement. There is uh, there are some comments here about recursive calls, but um, you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to act specifically handle those cases. So don't worry about that. You're given these logs. One good thing about the logs is that the function IDs in these logs are zero numbered. So you can actually create the result array directly and um, like keep updating the result array directly for the function IDs that you see. Um, so that's a good, that's a good input format that we have. Also, yeah. So basically, uh, if you read the question, what you'll realize is it basically follows the same pattern you see when you execute any normal program, right? Um, you have a main function and then um, maybe you will declare a variable, let a equal to four, then you'll call some child function, then you'll probably print inside main then you'll probably call another child function to do whatever and then I don't know why I'm putting in semicolons I shouldn't be putting semicolons with Swift but anyway irrelevant cool uh, yeah so that's how it is uh, you uh, so if we follow this example the function ID for main yeah so how will we actually uh, construct the solution is that we'll have a stack for all the function IDs a normal function call stack like just how you do in any normal program execution and uh, you, we will okay let me talk about the other things later but so you'll first push the function ID for main to the stack and then you'll spend some time inside a main to uh, create this variable that can you can think of that as this time slice and then you'll create a child function so child one's function id will be pushed to the stack and let's say this blue part is where the child one is executing and um, so it will spend some time inside child one and then we'll return from child one so we'll pop child one's function id so now the top of the stack becomes main's function id and then we will spend again spend some time inside main because we'll do print a and then we'll spend some time inside child 2 so child 2 is function id will be pushed and pop it follows a very regular uh, function call stack procedure so um, yeah we'll maintain that stack also one thing to realize is about this problem is that these logs the times that are mentioned in these logs are timestamps okay they are absolute they're absolute points in 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 the timeline so how do you actually calculate these time slices what we'll do is we'll maintain we'll keep a variable to hold the value of the most recent timestamp that we have seen so there will be one timestamp that we are seen currently the one that we are currently processing and we'll have one value for the most recent timestamp that we have seen and the difference between these two will give us that time slice value. So what I mean by time slices is this 0 to 1 or 1 to 5 or 5 to 6. This is what I mean by time slices. And we'll process the logs array as we see it. Like we'll process it from beginning to end. We'll, as soon as we see a um, time slice, we'll immediately update the exclusive time for the function ID in the results array. Yeah, so as soon as we see any time slice, let me repeat that. And as soon as we see any time slice, when I say when I say time slice, it basically means whenever we see a log, we would be looking at a time slice. So we'll immediately add the value of that time slice to the value for the function ID in the result array. And that result array is zero number. Like we can you'll realize that that's more of an implementation detail. Let me not delve too deeply into that part. Uh 
what else is there okay yeah i think the tricky and frustrating part i think i can address it quickly here so the thing is um, when someone tells you that a task has been executing from time 2 to time 5 what do you think like and if they, they ask you how much time did you spend inside that function you would probably say 5 minus 2 3 but that would be wrong because if you look at this it, it should be 2 3 4 5 right so that it's actually 4 so that is some minor adjustment that we have to do it's actually trickier than i'm making it seem but uh, so what we'll do is we'll only make that adjustment when we are actually calculating whenever we encounter an end time we won't account for that when we are when we are processing a start time log you, you actually have to only encounter you only have to make that adjustment once right for any for any time slice for any total time spent inside a function you need to make that adjustment once so we will do it at the end when we see an end log for a function yeah you will you will appreciate that more when we start coding as far as the uh, explanation of the solution goes i think we are good uh, you can assume that we will always uh, get a valid uh, valid array of logs like you won't uh, like you won't get an end log at the beginning you won't like uh, the logs array will not start with an end log like none of those things you can assume that uh, you'll always have a valid array of logs okay i don't want to spend too much time in explanation because i've done like i've explained everything um i'm just going to get to the coding part let me just comment this i'll keep it around for you to refer for me to refer to while I explain. Um, so one small comment, uh, the, the struct, if you're not familiar with structs, it's think of it as, it as a class. It's not a class, but just think of it that way. It's not important to the solution. So Swift does not have a stack API. That's why I've already uh, created the stack struct so that I don't waste time on it during the video. It's not something the lead code gave me. Uh, cool, I'm just going to start quickly. Cool, so let me instantiate a stack. I'm going to create the result array of size oh. okay uh, an int array of size n oh god yeah sorry guys about that initializing all values as zero and functions this n has been passed to us cool um so uh, one thing that i'm going to exploit is uh, we'll always have at least two logs i mean that's not how the constraints are given but i've submitted the solution once so i know so i'm just going to exploit that um, the logs array will always have at least two entries okay so what i'm going to do is i'm going to deconstruct the first log so just to initialize my uh, variables cool so let's call this components so the first log i'm directly going to index it this is swift's api to tokenize a string by a delimiter which is a colon in this case so components will be an array of all the different components within that log and uh, what we'll do is so as you remember the st stack maintains a stack of function ids so i'm just going to push the first function id to the stack cool casting that to an integer okay, why did i create an extra parenthesis here okay. the first so the first first like component of any log is the function id so I've just pushed that. I'm going to force unwrap it. If you're not familiar with force unwrapping, uh, like uh, don't uh, spend too much time on, on trying to understand what that explanation does. Uh, if you're a Swift developer, I'm just taking the easy way out. I'm force unwrapping it. If you're sub, if you don't have these exclamation marks in your programming language, don't think about it too much. It's not relevant to the solution right now. Um, cool. As I said, I'm going to maintain a most recent that's the most recent timestamp 
okay also i'm assuming that the first log will always be a start log okay cool so force unwrapping this oh okay cool uh, so i'm going to start my loop from one because i've already processed the first log and then we at least have two logs okay we're going to reset return this result and just type that in quickly cool uh so we're going to use the same components variable so whichever so this is the current log that we are processing then components that are separated by the colon delimiter okay let's so the function id will be the first component the event the meaning is it a start or an end log it will be a simple string not going to do anything to it components okay and then the timestamp which will be okay i'm just going to copy paste this i'm going to try and be lazy okay cool uh need a p there cool so there are only two kinds of events that we can have so i'm just going to put in a direct if else check if it is a start event and if the stack is not empty what i'll do is okay i think i'll have to spend some time in explaining this part okay minus most recent timestamp okay now uh let me move myself okay so the most recent timestamp and the current timestamp that we are seeing is the time spent inside the stack top inside the function id that is at the top of the stack okay what i whatever time is spent from now is the time that i'll spend in this current function id yeah i that is very important to understand um yeah so we have a current timestamp okay which is this timestamp it is a current log that we are processing the time between this and the most recent timestamp is a time spent inside the stack top inside the i i am not sure if i should say it but uh, okay let's just say stack top the current okay so think let me go back to this example so uh, what if we see the start log for child one okay what uh, so the most recent timestamp that we would have seen before that would be main start right so whatever time is spent from that most recent to now the start log of child one is the time spent inside main in doing this part let a equal to four and the function id at the top of the stack will be main's function id so we will update the value for the function id for main inside the result array cool cool uh, i hope i was able to explain that well because that is crucial to the understanding of the solution anyway let me proceed and then we will push this function id to the stack and we'll also update the most recent timestamp that we have seen to this timestamp yeah makes i hope that makes sense so basically think of it, it this of think of it in the perspective of from the perspective of this example we have seen the start log of child 1 and now we are going to push child 1's function id to the stack and we are going to update the most recent timestamp to child 1 start 
timestamp okay and if it's not a start event it has to be an end event in which case we will if we see an end event like you'll probably have to do this on pen and paper or you'll just have to do some dry runs on your own to realize that whenever you see an end, end timestamp it will definitely belong it will definitely be the end log of the function id which belongs to the stack top yeah so if you think of it from this example child one will start and child one will end it will never happen that child one start will be followed by mains end right like that would not even happen in a normal program execution and that will not happen with the logs that we see in lead codes example so you have to realize this that whenever you see an end log it will definitely mark the end for the function id which is at the top of the stack and we need to pop that because it signifies the end of uh, the time spent inside that function id okay so let the current function id I don't know if I should call it current, but it's okay. This is basically, mm, yeah, let's call it current, okay. So, and please realize I'm directly updating the result array. I'm directly adding that time slice values to the uh, function IDs index in the result array. So our result array is being updated on the fly in that inside that loop and eventually we just have to return the result array cool. updating it for the current function id again it will be the same as this formula timestamp except for that one adjustment that i spoke about when i was explaining the approach and I'm going to add that one year. Okay. That this is very important. This is, I think, the, the reason for all those dislikes. This one catch. Okay, anyway. And now also realize that this adjustment also has to be done when we update the most recent timestamp. Yeah. And that's it. As far as the solution goes, this is it. I hope I haven't made any silly mistakes. Let's see. Okay, what have I done? Oh, okay, okay, I'm going to force unwrap this. Again, if you're not familiar with Swift, don't worry about it. It's not relevant to the solution. Okay, that works. Cool. Uh, thank you guys for watching the video. I hope I did a good job in explaining the solution. I was one among the people who was frustrated at the solution because it seems easy at first and then you end up spending more time than you anticipated and it just gets to you. Anyway, happy lead coding guys. See you. Bye.